with over 2,000 jubilant passengers aboard. Go ahead, board, sir. Her cutting-edge features showed off well from above. No lifeboats were to be seen on deck. They were retracted into recesses of the superstructure. Her engines, and therefore the funnels, were placed aft and side by side. All this making her sleeker and with much more deck space, and Canberra was fastest in the fleet. But despite her importance, there were so many other players among the great fleets of ships operated by all the companies then associated with the P&O Group. Ships such as the 11,000 gross ton Huntingdon, sailing under the flag of the Federal Steam Navigation Company. The 9,000 gross ton Fassistan, one of over 20 ships operated by Strickline. The New Zealand shipping company's 17,000 gross ton passenger cargo liner Rengitata, seen here in Wellington. Then there were the many smaller vessels, such as the 1,200 gross ton Lancashire Coast, operated by coastlines. Another Strickline ship, the 8,000 gross ton Baharistan. The 20,000 gross ton passenger liner and troop ship Navasa was part of the great fleet operated by British India. Here she's sailing from Liverpool. And there were ferries such as the 15 knot, 4,000 gross ton Norwind operated by North Sea Ferries. In New Zealand, Union Steamship's 8,000 gross ton Māori worked between Wellington and the South Island port of Littleton. There were many other famous shipping companies such as Asiatic Steam, ENA, Haynes, Mogul Line, Moss Hutchison, James Norse, Sharistan Steamship, General Steam and of course Orient Line. But to the men who wore the uniforms of P&O itself, their own passenger cargo ships were the most cherished of all. Ships such as the 10,000 gross ton Aden, seen here on her way to Australia. Originally named the Somerset, her black funnel once wore the colours of the Federal Line. And whether on a luxury liner or one of their many cargo vessels, the crews of P&O ships were always keen to create their own version of the equatorial crossing the line ceremony. This must be the most filmed event in maritime history. In Tasmania's Port Huon, the 9,000 gross ton Perim was about to embark on an epic voyage to New Zealand, the United States and Canada. In coastal waters, there were always plenty of other interesting ships to be seen, operated by rival shipping companies. But nothing stirred P&O crews' excitement more than when they passed a ship belonging to their own fleet. Out came the cine cameras to record the moment. One of them captured this rare footage of the old Orontes. She flashed a signal of greeting to the Perim. And a short while later, she passed very close to the majestic Orsova. After a short stay in New Zealand, the Perim then headed across the Pacific. Her 89 officers and crew made the most of the warm tropical weather, but they could only take the plunge a few at a time in their tiny canvas and warm pool. The 15.5 knot Perim was built by Barclay Curl, Glasgow, in 1945. Although originally intended for the UK Australian service, she sailed all over the world, encountering every conceivable type of weather. Here, at the end of her northerly voyage to Canada, the temperature drops considerably. Look, Katie, I've written your name in the Arctic snow. It was at times like this that the crew really appreciated the warmth and comfort of their ship. Well, some of them did, but sweeping Perim's bridge was just about manageable. 
compared to the decks aboard Ard Shield. She was a giant 218,000 ton deadweight supertanker. Here she is en route for the Gulf and then Japan. Nearly a quarter of a mile long with a capacity of over 250,000 cubic meters. Built in 1969 by Mitsui Zosen in Japan, Ard Shield had a single screw and was powered by two steam turbines, which gave her a service speed of 16 knots. P&O had entered the tanker trade in 1959 and later set up Trident tankers to manage the Ard Shield and the rest of this fleet. The greatest part of P&O's investment at this time was in cargo ships, ranging from tankers, container ships, bulk carriers, liquefied gas carriers, as well as cargo liners. Ard Shield was equipped with all the very latest technology. As she spent most of her time at sea, vital supplies, including much appreciated mail, were often delivered to the ship by helicopter. Even on a giant ship like this, setting down on deck could be both tricky and hazardous, especially in heavy weather. In the mid-1970s, P&O decided to pull out of the crude oil ocean-going tanker business and concentrate on other cargo shipping, such as dry bulk carriers. The expensive Trident venture came to an end. The crews of all P&O cargo ships were no strangers to rough weather. Here the Patonga and the Bendigo sailed through stormy seas. But there was never any cause for alarm for anyone aboard whilst in the safe hands of those skilled P&O officers and men. They would never behave in a way that could possibly be considered to be anything other than entirely sensible. Uh, like building their own transport, complete with company flag to help them get round the decks of a big ship. An impromptu dance on the bridge in the heat of the noonday sun. Or just go for a dip in a shark infested sea. But when it came to a real emergency, there were no finer seamen. Here in 1961, the 9,000 gross ton Somali has been hit by a Swedish ship off Dungeness in thick fog and left with a 40-foot gash amidships. Somali's crew coped with the crisis admirably. They followed the immediate emergency procedures, leaving head office to sort out the tangle of insurance issues later. P&O is a complex, ever-changing global business. In 1971, the group was reorganized into five divisions. One, General Cargo, decided to boost its image by giving its new ships names beginning with Strath. I name this ship Strath Devon. May God bless her and all who sail in her. Sunderland Yards of Austin Pickersgill in 1975, the Strath Devon glides into the water. Many of the existing ships operated by P&O's associated companies were renamed in a similar way and repainted with a new hull colour, which was a pale imitation of Orient Line's corn. Strath services introduced fast ships like the Matura seen here in New Zealand. In 1882, the old Matura had taken three and a half months to sail there from the UK, whereas the new Matura could do the same journey in just three and a half weeks. Here in London's Royal Docks, it would appear that it's business as normal. But for many of the people who'd spent all their lives working for any one of the many associated companies within the P&O group, 
The idea of losing their own long-established and very proud individual identities was something they found very difficult to accept. Here's Strickline's 14,000 gross ton Nagaristan in Yokohama, now renamed Strathaird. She seems to have lost all her former dignity. Her once proud chevron decorated funnel having been replaced by what many considered to be the less imaginative colours of Strath services. Some of the ships and people in the group managed to hang on to a little of their tradition for a while, like Federal Line's new wild reefers. But for most, this was the sad end of a long and very proud history. For a few, it was no change as they crossed the globe. The 12,600 gross ton South Brora was one of the original three cargo ships to have Strath names. The decision to bring the associated cargo lines together meant that the companies involved would no longer compete on price and could quote the same freight rates. It also meant that the fleet of general cargo vessels operated by the group would be reduced to some 70 ships. This was part of P&O's biggest ever shift in its cargo operations, gradually moving over to containerization and ultimately the sale or scrapping of the whole conventional fleet. The new age of shipping was driven by uncomfortable, ruthless pressures to fill every available square inch of space. The familiar old routines and atmospheres aboard a cargo ship began to change as both men and their ships felt the effects of the stringent demands of the group's accountants. The 11,000 ton deadweight Strathanna was originally Strickline's Registan. Again, she doesn't look quite the same without her chevron decorated funnel as she sails from Britain to the Red Sea ports. It's strange to think how many of the men who once sailed these vessels still look back with sad nostalgia to the days and ships they once so enjoyed. Ships like the old Bendigo won't be forgotten. Back in time, she's making her way steadily through the warm blue waters of the Indian Ocean on her way to Australia. but one for getting things done. The sturdy 9,000 gross ton Bendigo was built by Alexander Stephen and Sons at their Glasgow yards in 1954. She had a single screw powered by three double reduction geared turbines producing 13,000 SHP, giving her a comfortable service speed of 17 knots. In 1968, she was renamed Pando Sound when she was transferred from the Australian trade to join the revised P&O Far Eastern service. It's been a month since sailing from the UK and the fantastic sight of Sydney Harbour Bridge is very welcome. It's almost as dramatic as you sail under it, like a giant doorway into the harbour. And there to witness Bendigo's arrival were so many other memorable ships flying the Red Ensign, as well as the odd foreigner like Italy's rather sleek looking 13,000 gross ton Oceania. And there's Federal Lines Cornwall looking magnificent in her traditional colours. 
tidally berthed among the many ships in Sydney Harbour, the Bendigo is somewhat overshadowed by her neighbour, one of the great Strathboats. This is a real rarity in Merchant Marine Memories, film of two elderly sisters saying their final goodbyes. Off the coast of West Africa in May 1957, the Atranto is flying her paying off pendant as she passes Orontes, homeward bound on her very last voyage. The launching of Final Voyage rockets adds to this celebration of nautical respect. Only a few years later, in 1962, it's the turn of Orontes to fly her paying off pendant as she passes the Orcades for the final time. Just the name of Southampton on the side of a boat train causes tremendous excitement, especially for those fortunate passengers about to embark on the journey of a lifetime. As it gathers speed, passing important landmarks for its passengers, just being aboard the boat train is thrilling. As it gets closer and closer to the great port, so their tingling excitement grows. Then, as the train begins to slow, comes the arrival in Southampton itself. The Queen Elizabeth is in port, so is Shaw Savile's Southern Cross. But these passengers are about to join one of the great P&O White Sisters, the Chuzan, to enjoy a wonderfully relaxing Mediterranean cruise. <laughs> Suzanne's big sister, the Canberra, is berthed just in front and ready to bid her bon voyage in true P&O nautical tradition. In the 1960s, under the chairmanship of Sir Donald Anderson, P&O began to make further major changes. Ships such as the Jazan were extensively modernised, enabling them to supplement the traditional line voyages with profitable cruising. Altogether, there were now 11 great white liners, their celebrated yellow funnels a regular spectacle all over the world. Arcadia steams gracefully into Sydney on her around the world service. Starboard 20. After World War II and the resumption of P&O's commercial services, over half a million emigrants had sailed to Australia. Now the potential was in the global leisure market, people with money to spend on quality. That is the port shoulder tug. Warren, open out, head very quietly. The Himalaya is on a profitable voyage around the world. The time is noon. This is the navigator. From departure Suva until noon today, Himalaya has steamed a distance of 300 nautical miles at an average speed of 21.74 knots. The air temperature on the bridge is 72 degrees Fahrenheit, that is 22 degrees centigrade, and the sea temperature is 77 degrees Fahrenheit, 25 degrees centigrade. Himalaya is expected to arrive at the entrance to the Havana Passage at approximately 0545 tomorrow. 
The 14,000 gross ton Chitral and her sister Cathay were kept on P&O's long established Far Eastern service. Arcadia's sister, the Iberia, is about to pass beneath San Francisco's famous Golden Gate Bridge on her worldwide sailing. In what was to become a whole era of acquisitions and mergers by P&O, the days of the great Orient Liners were now numbered. Orient Line was destined to become wholly absorbed by P&O, and her ships were also destined to lose their precious identity, their much-cherished corn-coloured hulls. In 1964, passengers arriving in Southampton to join one of those great O-boats found them flying the colours of P&O Orient Line and repainted in P&O's all white. Only the name Oronce was the same. In 1966, the operating name P&O Orient Lines was changed simply to P&O Line marking the end of one of Britain's most famous shipping names whose history could be traced back to the 18th century. But these former Orient liners, together with their devoted crews, brought in their renowned reputation for excellent service and expertise to bolster P&O's established image as being the world's premier line voyage and cruise ship operator. Because these ships have been designed and custom built for both upmarket line voyages and cruising the hot tropics, they help P&O to adapt to the growing threat of air travel and the changing patterns of the market. The merger of Orient Line and P&O was similar to the unification of White Star and Cunard many years before, and it worked. P&O had first acquired an interest in the Orient Line way back in 1919. But even as that P&O holding grew over time, there was still a real sense of rivalry between the two. It was difficult to accept that the way of life and traditions of that great company had now gone forever. In order to stay afloat in the desperately competitive world of shipping, P&O often had to make difficult decisions, which in the main proved to be well judged. Every ship was uniformly white. Orient's Ariana was the last to lose the line's colours. She's on a voyage around the world and passing the Sea Princess. The late 1960s were perhaps the most turbulent years P&O ever had to face. There was the almost crippling seamen strike, followed closely by the Six-Day War and the long-term closure of the Suez Canal. The Suez Crisis led to the decision to discontinue services to India, which P&O had operated for 127 years. The upheavals persuaded even more people to travel by air, and P&O lost a lot of its traditional passenger trade but the group was already starting to diversify and invested heavily in roll-on, roll-off ferries. At Dover, the P&O Stena Ferry Kent starts her crossing to Calais. Built in Germany in 1980, the 20-knot Kent was designed to carry nearly 2,000 passengers and 460 cars. She was originally named the Spirit of Free Enterprise. Under the chairmanship of Lord Stirling, from modest beginnings, P&O's ferry interests grew massively with a series of business alliances and takeovers, resulting in P&O becoming one of the world's biggest ferry operators at the turn of the 21st century. Here's the German-built 26,000 gross ton Calais. She has capacity for over 2,000 passengers, as many as 650 cars, at a service speed of 22 knots. P&O's UK ferry interests included routes across the Irish Sea to the Scottish Isles, across the North Sea, 
and from Portsmouth to Spain with huge ferries like the 37,000 gross ton 22 knot Pride of Bilbao. In the early 1970s, P&O's deep sea passenger fleet was in a sorry state, mostly consisting of older vessels that couldn't compete in the booming US market. Many new cruise companies began operating with purpose-built ultra-modern ships. To fight back, in 1974, P&O acquired the Los Angeles-based Princess Cruises and separate passenger classes were abolished. Together with buying and later building purpose-designed cruise ships, Princess Cruises and other acquisitions helped to make P&O one of the world's largest cruise line operators. A fleet renewal and expansion program had begun that was to take P&O comfortably into the 21st century. A new day dawns at the dockside and we're into that new millennium. P&O has placed big orders for ships and ferries. They'll be operating some 25 container ports in 16 countries. More mergers will lead to a bulk cargo carrying capacity five times greater than when they operated hundreds of small cargo ships. A gleaming juggernaut laden with British glass rolls onto one of the latest additions to the P&O ferry fleet, the Pride of Rotterdam. She's one of two they're the largest in the world. Built at Italy's Fincantieri yards, this 22-knot ship has luxury accommodation, first-class facilities, and service equal to many cruise liners. It offers a whole new dimension to an overnight voyage between Britain and Holland. And what really puts the scale of this giant North Sea ferry into perspective is that at 60,000 gross tons, she, a ferry, is a third bigger than the Titanic. And over 160 years ago, P&O's first mail ship, Don Juan, was just 933 tons. P&O also invested heavily in Princess Cruises, introducing such ships as the 109,000 gross ton Grand Princess. With a dozen of these super cruisers, all offering super passenger comforts, in October 2000, P&O Princess Cruises was made an independent listed company. The Grand Princess was also built at Italy's Fincantieri yards. She's too large to transit the Panama Canal and so spends her summers in the Mediterranean and winters in the Caribbean. In the mid-1920s, the combined P&O fleet was nearly 500. In 1983, it had shrunk to just 42 ships. Today, it numbers well over 70, with many more new ships on order. One of the very latest to join the P&O Princess Cruises fleet is another 109,000 gross ton ship, Golden Princess. Here in Southampton, she's preparing for her maiden voyage. Today, P&O and its associates operate cruise ships designed to suit every taste, including culturally-based cruises offered by Swan Hellenic and German-based Aida cruises catering for the younger element. When walking through the luxurious, spacious accommodation of some of these new superliners, it's often difficult to realize you're still on a ship that can take you far across the seas to the places of dreams, just as P&O liners did a hundred years ago. As we stand dwarfed by this giant creation of man towering high above the Southampton Quaysides, with the help of more very rare archive film, let's step way back in time again to the year 1932 and the arrival in Bombay of the Strathaird. She and her sister, the Strath neighbor, were just as radical in design to people who saw them then as the latest P&O liners of today are to us. Although the cars and lorries that rumble through the streets of Bombay are not quite state-of-the-art, more state-of-the-cart that won't start. And if you need a taxi, it's only going to be two horsepower. A classic blue funnel liner lies at anchor in the bustling harbour, as after a short stay, Strathaird readies herself to sail for London. Built by Vickers Armstrong at Barrow and Furness in 1931, the Strathaird and her sister Strathnaver were designed to be the finest and fastest ships on the Australian service. They were also the very first P&O liners to have a white hull and yellow funnels. 
not just a solitary newfangled streamlined job, three proper smokestacks. In the first part of a hundred years of P&O, we saw a rare film of the old Corfu, and we said that when originally built, she had two black funnels and a black hull. Well, this amazing piece of film is of her sister ship, the Carthage, shot in 1932 from the Strathaird. She shows off the same smart uniform. An amazing old trooper and much loved by those who knew her. But perhaps the most famous and popular liner ever to serve in the P&O fleet was the Canberra. P&O's great flagship for 36 years. Between 1961 and 1997, she carried over one and a half million passengers. In the early 1970s, when air travel really took hold and fuel costs soared, business was really bad. So P&O sent her to New York for a series of Caribbean cruises. But P&O and Canberra just weren't well enough known to break into the US market, and after huge financial losses, she was sent back to Southampton. In 1973, after only 12 years' service, plans were made for her to be scrapped. Rumours spread predicting the collapse of the whole P&O passenger fleet. But in 1973, P&O decided to scrap the Orsova, replacing her with Canberra on her around-the-world cruising programme. The result was a huge success for years to come. Canberra had found her very profitable niche, but then in April 1982, towards the end of a world cruise, she was suddenly given a dramatic and crucial new role in the Falklands War. Even before she arrived home, she was boarded by commandos and admiralty officials to start converting her into a battle-ready troop ship. Back in Southampton, hundreds of tons of stores and military material were loaded, and she set sail on Good Friday evening with over 2,000 troops aboard. She had to be made capable of doing the difficult job of replenishing at sea, taking on fuel and supplies. For that month, as she travelled the thousands of miles to the South Atlantic, troops from the Parachute Regiment and Royal Marine Commandos did everything they could to prepare for this very unpredictable conflict. Canberra and her flotilla arrived in the Falkland San Carlos water in the heat of battle and she began to disembark her 2,000 troops. Under relentless Argentinian air attack, HMS Arden was sunk and HMS Argonaut badly damaged, but Canberra suffered no casualties. Her great white bulk made her so conspicuous that it was a mystery how the enemy fighter planes could have missed her. She did further vital troop carrying and supply work, and after the Argentinian surrender, she repatriated over 4,000 prisoners of war. On the 11th of July, 1982, after 25,000 miles and three months at sea, crammed with Royal Marine Commandos, the Canberra, or the Great White Whale, as she'd now been affectionately renamed by all aboard, appeared triumphantly out of the Solent's morning mist. A huge, noisy armada of small boats soon surrounded her to give her and all aboard a hero's welcome home. And never before had a civilian ship received such a tumultuous welcome. No lavish advertising campaign could have beaten it. Because of the so-called Falklands factor, Canberra was set for sell-out business for the next 15 years. But then... Farewell. Canberra had far exceeded her life expectancy. In September 1997, to a massive rousing send-off, she sailed from Southampton's Mayflower Terminal on her final celebration cruise under the command of Rory Smith, the last of Canberra's 26 captains. The ship was packed. Every berth had been booked for months in advance. Everyone went out of their way to cheer. Here off the coast of Portugal, the P&O liner Victoria alters course to say her very own special farewell to her big white sister. Canberra crewmen proudly displayed the golden cockerel for the last time. It was a very old tradition in the fleet that the golden cockerel was held by the fastest ship. Canberra had inherited it from the old Oriana and would soon be handing it over to her successor, the new Oriana. King Neptune had laid on the calmest of seas as she sailed toward the port of Cannes where she'd meet Oriana. Big new sister was trim, ready and waiting under the command of Captain Colin Campbell. What a greeting and farewell it was to be.
there was a final exchange of messages between the two captains. That was a truly memorable sight and one I'm very pleased I was able to see. Absolutely tremendous, Roy. Absolutely tremendous. Absolute knockout. Everyone was experiencing their own very personal memories and feelings as Captain Rory Smith made the sad, historic announcement. All our pre-departure safety checks have been satisfactorily completed and Canberra is about to sail for the last time from a foreign port. Now you are leaving, your journey is through You served us so proudly, you kept and crew We'll always remember Where we may be Our home here on Canberra Our home on the sea This is it. Come on, let's hear you, everybody. Loud as you can. The decks deserted as the cold morning mist parted like curtains on a West End stage and the great star appeared before the world to take her very last bow. Sadly, there were to be no encores. The show was over. This was her final salute. Her record-breaking career was toasted by the last few of her one and a half million passengers. An airborne tribute was flown by an RAF Canberra jet bomber and then the captain's routine command that this time had very special meaning on the maritime stage. Finish with engines. Finish with engines. That's finish with engines, sir. The din suddenly subsided. Quiet moments for all the passengers and crew members who'd ever sailed aboard Canberra to mourn her going. Her end was also lamented by millions of people all over the world, for she marked the end of the golden years of shipping. She was the very last of an era of great line voyages. This time there would be no return as Canberra sailed without ceremony to her breakers in some far distant foreign land. In April 2000, through the curtains of mist in the Solent came the new lead in p and epic sea saga, the magnificently modern 76,000 gross ton superliner Aurora. We've been looking back at just 100 years of p and the company's story of course spans over 160 years. From our rich film archives we've had just a glimpse of life sailing with p and through the decades. Today's passengers on P&O Princess Cruises enjoy many of the old seafaring traditions alongside the latest superliner luxury. There was a magic about the past, but there's a lot more to look forward to. And what stories will children of today have to tell and indeed show to their own grandchildren about their seagoing adventures? We are sailing. Dolphins greet us and light play.